This is Radio EcoShock with Alex Smith. During two years of pandemic, the climate action camps are empty, climate protests are few, most people are more afraid of losing their jobs or getting sick than they are about a hot, unstable future a decade away. But the big storms, the fires, the floods, the strange weather, they just keep on coming, pandemic or not. And they come along with hair-raising warnings from scientists. Is there a plan to save us from terrible climate change? Tom Bowman thinks there can be. And Tom advises businesses and governments on next green steps. He's the author of the book, What If Solving the Climate Crisis is Simple? And now a new work, Resetting Our Future, Empowering Climate Action in the United States. And that book contains a big strategic plan for the U.S. It ties into a program meant to work in every country. So maybe it could include you wherever you live. From California, Tom Bowman, welcome to Radio EcoShock. Thank you, Alex. It's so great to be with you. So in your business life, you specialized in exhibitions and communications about the environment, climate, and science. But now we're cut off physically during the pandemic. We may try to form online crowds. How do you think the COVID-19 pandemic has reshaped climate activism? Well, it has, it has opened some doors that we haven't seen before. You know, there's been a long history of thinking that, that our response to climate change is going to be a very slow gradual process. It's going to take years and decades, you know, to wean ourselves from fossil fuels. And what the, the, the pandemic has been a horror, but on the other hand, it's had a silver lining. It has shown us just how quickly societies can change. You know, it was a little over a year ago that everyone in the world suddenly stayed home. And it, it happened over a matter of a few days, less than a week to be sure. And governments mobilized trillions of dollars to provide relief. And this shows that if people feel motivated, um, we can transform society on a dime. So you and Deb Morrison are editors of the new book, Empowering Climate Action. And it's really kind of the beginnings of a climate plan for America. And it's wrapped with notes about how the process came about and commentaries from some well-known activists. Why do we need this overall plan? We've already got a lot of activist groups uh, from Greenpeace, uh, too many to name, thousands of grassroots groups. Why do we need this plan? Well, and we have educators too, and we have innovators and communication professionals. The problem is that everyone's working in isolation, more or less. There is no unifying strategy to mobilize the public, to feel confident in participating, to provide support and pathways to participation. And so we leave the capacity of most people on the sideline. You know, there have been studies recently that have shown that that public confidence that we that our future will be brighter is very, very low. Most people feel defeated and overwhelmed by the complexity and the scale of the climate challenge. And yet there's a there's a clause, an article in the Paris Agreement called the Action for Climate Empowerment. Uh, process. And it challenges governments to find strategies to empower the public in each country to participate actively in creating and implementing solutions to this challenge. And if we do that, if, if, we, if we rally everyone around a common set of strategies, boy, the potential for, you know, to unlock the power of all this collective work that's going on would just be astonishing. Well, the Biden-Harris administration is already working on some climate plans. They've got a bit of it built into the infrastructure program with some green energy and changes to the grid. They're going to have to enact a lot of whatever plan we could come up with. Why not just leave the planning to big government? Yeah, that is such a great question. And it speaks to the fact that most of our uh, our thinking about how we're going to tackle big problems is top-down thinking. We assume that the government's going to come in and take care of it for us. And if we elect the right leader or the right leaders, um, they'll handle it for us. But that's not how societies really change. The way societies really change is when there's a collective sort of a gestalt about the direction we need to go. And, and people harness their energy, their creativity, their networks, their support structures, their associations, their businesses, all of these things um, 
we marshal those and we create change where we live all over the place. And that's what the Action for Climate Empowerment recognizes. It's not that we don't need the, the federal programs, the top-down programs, we certainly do. There's such important investments and market signals and regulations. So I'm kind of worried, though, about the white knight syndrome, whether it's Richard Branson or Jeff Bezos investing billions into climate or uh, Bill Gates is finally on board. Maybe they can save us. And I, I think there's a tendency among us, the ordinary people, to to shirk it off and, and as I say, hope some angel comes in and, and fixes this for us. I agree. And no offense to those those folks, but the idea that we can count on a handful of people to to invent our way out of this um, is kind of hubristic, you know, it, it kind of suggests that that we believe those people know things that the rest of us don't. In reality, the depth of knowledge and experience in this work is in communities even low-income communities, um, communities of color that never get represented and never get heard from. When you, when you really uh, engage with people who are doing that work, you discover that there is incredible expertise and, and all they need is support and capacity uh, and, and the world will change for the better. And you know, it's not that we don't, again, it's not that we don't need top down, we do, but the bottom up needs to meet the top down if we're gonna build broad support and broad participation. So what is this project called ACE? ACE is, ACE is an acronym for Action for Climate Empowerment. And it is the, it's Article 12 of the Paris Agreement and of the underlying UNFCCC treaty that most nations of the world have signed on to. And it basically says that governments are challenged to find net, to create national strategies to empower, engage, and inform their publics to be co-creators of the future, the climate future. And it's, it, it, the language is, um, it's about gender equity. It's about, it's about equity for future generations. Um, they, the UN language doesn't embrace racial equity and some other forms of equity. But here in the United States, the group that, that worked to create this, uh, this framework that's in the book um, really did embrace gender equity, indigenous rights, the voices of low-income communities and others whose voices are never heard. So it's basically getting away from the big business community and the political powers and discovering the wealth of capacity that exists among the rest of us. So the process comes partly from the United Nations plan, and I'm plugged into climate science. I pay attention to climate activism, help when I can. I'm embarrassed to say I never heard of this. I did not know it existed. Is it better known in other countries, or what's the barrier to this getting out there? I would say don't be embarrassed because it's it's the little known secret in the Paris Agreement. And the reason I say that in some ways is that none of the major emitting countries of the world has yet come up with a national strategy. So this work that we did in 2020, uh, this group of 150 climate leaders from all over the place is really groundbreaking. There are other countries, Austria, Canada, for example, that are working on ACE now but it has been, and there are, there are uh, smaller emitting nations that have created national plans that kind of assigned it to their ministries of education where it has very limited power and scope. Uh, and ACE is about much more than education. So, so we're kind of at the cutting edge here with this project. And it speaks to the fact, again, that we have thought about climate solutions in technocratic and technological terms rather than embracing the power of communities to determine their own future. So this is really a, a turning of a corner in a way that, that the world is awakening to. And, and the next Congress of the Parties, COP meeting, which will be in January of 2021, the ACE issue is very much in the planning conversations. Uh, and countries are supposed to to provide updates on how they're doing on this. And so it's really kind of rising to the fore, it seems, in the international negotiation work. And let's hope it does, because it, that's where it belongs. How could a small government or a nonprofit get involved in this planning process? Well, um, so 
anyone can visit the website for this project. It's aceframework.us, literally A-C-E framework.us. And that's where you can download a copy of the report and read it. You can see the 400 or so signatories that have signed on to it uh, and much more information about the process that was used to create it, to co-create it with all of these people. Um, it's also in the book and, and the book will then take you to, um, to the website. The website's there. At this point, the team that created it is working very hard to find avenues for implementation. Um, the United States just now has, has designated what's called a national focal point for ACE. That's a person, or in, I think in this case, probably two people who report to the United Nations process about ACE in the United States. And they're, they're tasked with implementing, uh, creating and implementing a national strategy. So our thought is that there's very good chance that this is gonna start to gain steam within the Biden administration. That's our great hope. Uh, meanwhile, the work continues all over the place. As you said earlier, all the NGOs, all the others that are working, um, more and more of them are aware of this effort and they're understanding and, and hungry for the benefits of strategic alignment in their work. And so I would say start with aceframework.us, reach out to us through the email link there and, and uh, the bigger the network and coalition that we can form, the more power it will have. How do we know this isn't just a white guy thing? Um, well, I am a white guy, and 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 Deb Morrison is a white woman who wrote co co uh, edited the book. We were the writing team for this project, but we were not the creators of this project. We like to say um, we are the editors of the book, but we're or the writers of the book, but we're not its authors. The authors were a very very diverse group of of people. In fact, there's going to be a BIPOC, Black, Indigenous, and People of Color climate justice event on the uh, 7th or 8th of April, um, 8th of April, that's being organized by many of the people who are in the same uh, coordinating committee. And the idea is to speak to members of the Biden administration, members of Congress, members of federal agency, and put them into dialogue with BIPOC scholars and climate justice activists and experts. Um, and you'll discover there, and you can discover when you, when you look at the website and, and watch uh, the, the panel discussions from our opening session, that the representation really was diverse in terms of race, gender, age, um, uh, profession, geography. Um, this isn't a white guy um, effort at all. In fact, I have to honestly say it, you know, I'm used to talking into microphones. <laughs> I like to do it. Um, but it's a little odd to be one of the people representing this work because there are so many others involved who, who are people of color and speak with this with equal or better eloquence about this. Do you think, Tom, if we did polling in the United States, we would find a high level of support for climate action among Latinx and African-American communities? I think so. Um, I haven't looked at the data recently. Um, there was a time when, when concern or support seemed to lag behind in those communities, but I don't think that's true anymore. Um, overwhelming majorities of Americans want to see productive climate action coming out of the federal government. And I think that applies across racial groups. You are tuned to Radio EcoShock. I'm Alex Smith, and from California, our guest is green business advisor and climate expert Tom Bowman. And we're talking about resetting our future, empowering climate action in the United States. And so the book comes from a collaboration of many seasoned campaigners, which I really appreciate. But is are people ready to discuss the elephant in the room that perhaps we have too many people on the planet? Are environment, environmentalists ready for population control discussion? Well, that's an interesting question. And I don't think you're gonna get a consistent answer. It, you know, The more people you talk to, the more different answers you'll get. One of the most compelling ways people talk about this is in terms of providing economic opportunity and education for women and girls. You know, Gender equity leads to lower birth rates because women and girls have more options in life. Um, and that's important because that can reduce the population going forward dramatically. Um, and that's not only in the developing world, that's here as well. So 
so that's one of the ways people are comfortable talking about it. Um, I have worked with science organizations on, on science, climate science exhibits, and with only one exception, none of them ever wanted to talk about population. They felt that it was like talking about religion, you know, in a way that it, that it, it upsets people. People go to their ideological corners very quickly when you talk about reproduction and reproductive rights. And so it tends to be an, an issue that people don't want to engage with. But, but you know, here we are at what, 7.8 billion people on the planet headed towards nine or 10. Um, we wouldn't be having this conversation about climate change if there were still 2 billion people, 3 billion people. And that's a huge difference. So, um, so in addition to finding ways to mitigate emissions and get away from fossil fuels, the question of population is inevitably at least the elephant in the room, as you say. What are some of the challenges of promoting these ideas outside of California or New York uh, in rural areas? Is it really going to take off? Well, this is an interesting question. Um, I mean, an interesting point for discussion, I think. It's not just California. You know, the, the ACE work was embraced by people from all walks of life and all, all corners of the United States. Um, it's you, the issues are handled differently in rural communities. And, and I'll give you one anecdote um, and then I'll, uh, sort of a general rule of thumb about this. The anecdote is that there's a community in Kansas called Greensburg, a little farming town that was wiped out, literally destroyed by a, a tornado. And they rebuilt as a model green city. They're an international destination for people wanting to know how, how to use clean energy, how to rebuild with LEED certified buildings, how to, and how to reduce the environmental footprint of a, of a town. It's, a, it's an amazing story. And I was talking to one of the city leaders there and said, you know, why is it that you embrace these left coast liberal values? And he said, you know, that's how you talk about it. The way we talk about it is stewardship of the land. And that's what farmers do. We take care of our land. So, so there's a commonality of values at a certain level. Um, but if we want to talk about climate change in rural communities, I think that the issue of who does the talking, who does the engaging really, really matters. And that's true. That's true across the board. You know, people will listen to, to messengers who they trust. And there's a, there's kind of an adage uh, in communication about this issue that says simple messages repeated often by a variety of trusted sources. And that last piece, the variety of trusted sources means that, that, liberal coastal urban professionals are not the best spokespeople to be dealing with, with rural communities. That needs to grow from within and from the networks that support that kind of action in those communities who know them best. Well, that's going to have to include the churches then. Oh, it certainly will. And, and the agricultural community and, and others. Um, but you're right. It's a, it's a different, uh, it's a different group of messengers and also, um, there is the, sh the, the literal fact of, of setting aside the idea that we're going to communicate the truth to people and really engage with them where they are. You know, the, the most important characteristic of a good communicator is that they listen well and they, they learn to speak the language of the, of the audience and speak to the concerns of the audience. And that's something that we can all do a better job of. And I, and I don't mean that as a as a criticism, um, the social science community is always telling us that, that most of us overestimate how widely our views are shared, how widely our values are shared, how well we communicate. And it's sort of an admonition to say that it's a, that's a natural fact of being human. So let's concentrate on listening and finding ways to engage. Right. I was a small town reporter in a rural area for a few years, and I found that Nobody wanted to listen to me rant about anything, but I did become part of that community in a deep way because I listened and I asked people about their lives and their concerns and wrote about that. And that's what they wanted to hear in their paper. I worry now, though, and this is something you just kind of raised. Are we kidding ourselves by thinking that a hashtag campaign or a, a, a viral TikTok is going to save the planet? Isn't there a point where we have to come out of our shells into reality and, and, and do a lot of hard things. 
I think so. I think we have to actually engage with people. If we're going to if we're going to change race relations in this country and and create gender equity in this country and empower communities to determine the future that they want to have, that means we have to engage with each other. Um, it means we have to allow our perspectives to be challenged, and and that happens when we engage really deeply engage with other people. And that's what was so transformational about this ACE project. People came together, they left their social roles at the door, they left their logos at the door, their job titles at the door, and engaged as person to person and listened to one another and found common ground about some remarkably powerful um, opportunities. That's what we really have to do. And I know that doesn't sound uh, uh, big and sexy the way, you know, a new technology does, but it's really where the work takes place. And it's where the excitement is once you get into it. All right. And you've advised both businesses and governments on how to go much greener. I wonder, can those larger organizations create bridges to bring in the millions of ordinary people who fear climate damage and, and do want change? Is there a role here for the rest of us? We don't want to be just spectators. No, we shouldn't be spectators. And, and the truth is, uh, in this digital age, in the age of Facebook and, and, and Twitter and Instagram, um, people trust business communicators less than they used to. They trust politicians less than they used to. People are turning to one another for advice and for support and for opinions that will, that will be influential. And that means that we have to be authentic because nobody wants to pass on a message that seems contrived, right? And so much of what comes out of the corporate world sounds contrived. So, so again, the question is genuine engagement. And, and the fact is that all of us can make a huge difference. You know, I know some social scientists who study this issue really deeply, and they say that the biggest factor that's holding us back on climate action is that we just don't talk about it enough. Now, doesn't that sound small and simple? But the reality is that very few Americans actually talk about climate change with their family and friends and coworkers very frequently. And what that does is it, it the silence makes us all feel isolated and small and reluctant to, to speak up about something we care about. And if we break the ice, if we create opportunities to break the ice and people start to reveal how much they care about this, it builds a sense of social support that allows us all to recognize we have some shared norms, some shared concerns. And that has a way of, of really transforming communities dramatically. I kind of worry that as we waste and waste more years and the climate becomes more unstable that, you know, you think about the people in Louisiana were hit with storm after storm and then you get flood after flood and uh, your place burns down in a wildfire, you've got no insurance. People get beaten down, and I wonder then it might be too late to organize a really good fight to save what's left of the climate. What do you think? Yeah, uh, um, <laughs> you know, 40% of Americans claim that they will say in surveys that they have experienced climate change in their own lives, in their own communities. That means there's a huge number of people who, who, who believe that the climate is changing around them, and they may or may not have been hit by a real disaster. Um, and for those who haven't, letting them know that they're part of a community that really cares, um, that shares the same experiences and the same concerns has a way of empowering change. And, uh, and it happens at the community level. This is very grassroots, what I'm talking about. Um, and, but that's significant because it allows ripple effects to, to start to take place. And whether people call it climate response or they call it something else, cleaning up air pollution or, or other kinds of toxic pollution where they live, in a way, it doesn't matter if the results are the same. You know, they, they start to get things moving. So, so I would think that the, the, the most important thing is for those of us who care to be talking and, and working on this problem and and expanding the tent, connecting with others who care. Um, and then, you know, before we are in shell shock from having suffered a major loss, um, and also helping our communities plan for how we're going to cope with the losses. You know, just think of it in, in 2010, 20, 30 years, some communities will have to move 
they're too close to low lying and close to the ocean as the oceans rise or as more floods occur from rivers. Some places are just, people are living just in the wrong places. And this is gonna be a significant challenge. How are we gonna deal with that? That's conversations that communities really should start having today. Yeah, and I worry that, you know, there's a kind of burnout among the people who have been trying to be activists. Uh, we marched, we talked, we were artistic, uh, we lobbied, we got arrested, and yet emissions are still going up and there doesn't seem to be a break on this process before we drive right over the cliff. What if people don't believe anything will work? Then where do we go from here? Well, you know, I, <laughs> I used to say, uh, and I've said it many times, I wonder if the federal government's gonna be the last segment of society to get on board with this. In other words, why don't we make them irrelevant ourselves? Why don't we uh, cause create change in the towns where we live, in the, in the neighborhoods where we live? Um, and that means finding ways to reduce fossil fuel use in our own lives, in our own households, in our own businesses, and talking about what we're doing and why so that those around us start doing the same thing and talking to our local and regional representatives about these concerns and demanding climate action plans for our cities and towns where we live. We have a lot more influence locally and we have a lot more, the issue is more salient locally and there's less power coming from, you know, corporate dark money at the local level for the most part. And that means that we have more leverage locally. So, so it isn't only a political activism challenge, it's a behavioral challenge, it's a business challenge, it's a, it's a talking to our friends and neighbors challenge, um, and it's really profoundly a local challenge. And if we, if we tackle it that way, we not only experience positive benefits uh, in terms of new policies, new behaviors, cleaner air uh, where we live, fewer health effects of air pollution, um, we also gain a strong sense of connection to our neighbors and our coworkers and others that is deeply gratifying, frankly, um, and that keeps us going. So, so to everybody who suffered burnout from hitting their head against the wall, don't stop hitting it. <laughs> you know, uh, be smart about about the nails you choose to pound, um, and keep going because you know it seems like nothing's happening. It seems like nothing's happening. And then you wake up one day and realize how far we've come. And that's, that's what we're shooting for. The group you work with has come up with the right way to do this planning, but does that mean there is a plan yet? Uh, we, so a national strategy for ACE is an official act of the federal government. So there is none technically today. And in, you know, this, this project was in development for many years and it came to fruition in 2020 because the Trump administration pulled out of the Paris Agreement and that created a leadership vacuum. And there was a national election coming up in 2020 and there was hope that a Democrat would win, somebody who isn't a climate denier. And that's in fact what happened. We didn't know that outcome when we, when we uh, people began working on this process. Um, so the, the point of all that is to say essentially that, that when a group of people sees opportunity together to come together and, and create change, you know, stand back because you're going to see something impressive happen. As we wrap up here, Tom, what else are you working on these days? Well, so I still do some exhibit work. Um, I've been doing exhibits about for a water utility in California to explain where our water comes from. You know, here in Southern California, we get about half our water from 700 miles away in Northern California, which is, just think about that. I mean, this is how we live in the world today. Um, and so that's educational stuff for kids and for, uh, for adults to see. Um, I'm working still a great deal on this ACE work. Uh, most of us who have been involved in the project are devoting a lot of time to it to try to help it get off the ground uh, and create a, a, you know, move the framework, which is something that civil society members were able to create, hopefully leading to creating an official national strategy that influences markets, it influences government practice, it influences uh, uh, private funders to, for NGOs, and it helps 
all of us doing this work feel more aligned. And you know, that's such an important opportunity that everybody who's working on it is giving enormous numbers of pro bono hours just to keep this, keep this in development and keep pushing it forward because we know that this is a rare moment in time when there is a, there's a rare moment of opportunity and we wanna seize it. We don't wanna let it get slipped through our hands. How do people find you and this new book? Uh, so I'm at TomBowman.com. Very simple, B-O-W-M-A-N. Um, and the books are on my website. The books are on Amazon. Um, they're, they are, what if solving the climate crisis is simple and empowering uh, climate action in the United States. And also you can find, um, find out more about the ACE project at aceframework.com. Is it aceframework.com or aceframework.us? Excuse me. Yes, it's aceframework.us. That's exactly right. Thanks. Great. We've got it. And I'm going to put links to all of that in my own show blog at ecoshock.org, which comes out every Wednesday. Tom, it's been a pleasure meeting you. Thank you for joining us this week. Thanks so much, Alex. It's my pleasure. I'm Alex Smith for Radio Ecoshock. Mm -hmm.